The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. This episode is sponsored by The Op, also known as USAopoly. The Dice Tower, episode 717. Whoops-a-daisies! Welcome to The Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. In today's show, Eric joins Mandy and I to talk about a range of games that we've been playing, and we're going to serve up an affordable game pie. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. I'm Mandy Hutchinson. And I'm Eric Summerer. Eric! Woo! Woo! It's always so wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited to be here. Now, did I hear right? Are you getting on a plane soon? Oh, boy. To go to Florida? In just a little more than 24 hours as we record this, I will be getting on a plane and flying to Dice Tower HQ down in Homestead, Florida for the uh, Dice Tower Summer Spectacular. It's a whole week this week. In fact, as we post this episode, it will have begun already or it will be starting uh, Tuesday. And uh, we're doing live streams of all sorts of games. I get to learn a bunch of games I haven't had a chance to play before, including, I think, Summer Camp. I think that's one I'm very excited to play. Oh. Um, and we'll, we'll be doing the Dice Tower Awards, which was also the subject of, of next week's episode here at the podcast. A bunch of other game shows and events and stuff. I'm just excited to see people. I'm a little nervous to be on a plane. Hmm. I will admit. Sure. Uh, but I, I, I'm ready to go. I'm vaxxed. I will be masked on the plane and I'm ready. Let's do this thing. That needs to be a shirt, I think. Vaxxed and max. Masked. <laughs> vaxxed and masked. Even... Ready to go. <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> That'll be great. That'll be awesome. I look forward to watching it. And I hope you have a blast. Absolutely. Indeed. Mandy, what are you doing in the show notes? Woman. So (laughs) we I like we have the show notes and then I see your little like cursor tippy tapping. What's going on? Oh, I'm sure you'll hear you'll hear it too, because my keyboard's really noisy. But um butterfly, I got a few more. Wow, you all are loving sharing your butterfly in your different languages to me and I'm more languages for it. More language. I, I, I was like, wow, there are so many and I'm happy for it. But this episode, I am so sorry. I dropped the ball, everybody. It's been a little busy with the day job and I didn't have time to sit down and listen to the pronunciations and I'm not going to come on here and butcher it in your language. We got to do it right. So got to do the research first. Got to do the research first. And I, I thank you for people who send me. I've received videos of pronunciation. Uh, you know, I've received audio. I'm here for it. Please, you know what? Keep sending it. If there's a language we haven't done, you send it in and I will do it. So (laughs) next episode, I promise I will uh, pronounce the ones properly that I received. I think there was um, Icelandic uh, language that was there. So I'm very interested to see about that one. So sorry about that, everybody. It's a a whoopsie-daisy type of episode today. (laughs) (laughs) Right, because the whoopsie-daisy is I completely forgot to post the poll for the title of last week's or last episode's title poll that was all about expansion. So I will put that up this time. I'm sorry. Uh, It's it's been a little busy. Uh, The episode actually released and I I, uh, just had a really busy week. So I apologize and we will fix that. And uh, and and you can tell us whether or not you like to expand your games for for next episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, oh, could could I jump in because I didn't get yeah. to share my thoughts. I sort of talked about this uh, on Dice Tower tonight recently with Crystal. We the, the subject came up, um, and and while I used to say yes, absolutely, I will pick up an expansion for a game I like. I'm becoming more resistant these days as it sure. becomes more mm-hmm. difficult to get them out. I've had way too many times that I. Pull out a game I like that I've just gotten an expansion for, or or I just got the expansion and and then bring out the game because of that. Right. But if I don't have players that know the game already, I usually have to scale it back to begin with. And I have to get to that level of everybody knows the base game before exactly. we can bring in the expansion. And that is more and more difficult, it seems, these days. And so I'm I'm sometimes looking at an expansion saying, I don't know if I need that. This game mm-hmm. doesn't hit the table enough to reach that level sure. of of um, familiarity with the base game. Yeah. Well, we'll see what others in the Dice Tower family say, but I get what you're, I get what you're putting down, Eric, for sure. That said, of late, Bandy and I like just played the Snow expansion mm-hmm. to the Magnificent, 
Mm. I flip and loved it. So I'm going to talk about an expansion that I played that I also flip and love. And maybe we'll talk a little bit more about when, even under the context that you're talking about, Eric, when it really does make sense to think about picking up an expansion, uh, especially if it's a game you love. All right. Absolutely. I know we've all got some games that we want to chit chat about, and I'm especially looking forward to hearing Mandy's thoughts on one of the games I see on her list. So let's get to it. So, what have you been playing lately? Okay, games played. So many games, but I'm going to try and narrow it down to the two that I think you all want to hear about. Mm. First off, though, uh, Suzanne, last episode, reviewed the game, and please correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Yukatoa? Yukatoa? Is that how you say it? Yes. Okay, I think so. (laughs) So I'm sure someone listening will 100% correct me, and that is okay. But uh, that's a game that came out by Darrington. It was published by Darrington Press. And I hadn't played it when Suzanne had reviewed it. So (laughs) got to it first. So I was able to play it um, with my family. And definitely when I played it, I was expe- I don't know what I was expecting, but it definitely is a lighter game. So it's one of those games right. where you'd play like in between other games potentially, or maybe just someone who likes really light games. Uh, I did like the fact that it played quickly, which was good. And maybe that's because we were terrible at it. But <laughs> <laughs> it went fairly quickly, but everyone seemed to enjoy it for the most part. Uh, this is the type of game where I like the fact that you could change the configuration of the boat um, because we didn't pay attention to the rules the first time. And I'm like, oh yeah, let's just put the tiles wherever. Yeah, it makes it significantly harder if you don't make them in the shape that they recommend for the first game. I don't know if you found that, Suzanne. Instead of that kind of pyramid shape, we kind of just randomly put them in a shape. And yeah, moving yeah. around makes it a lot more... I think that's one of the interesting elements of the game, for sure. Yeah, which I thought was cool, so you can ramp up the difficulty. So overall, for me, I thought it was a fine game. It was, you know, it is what it is. It's a light game. It's it's something that I feel is... And I know people are going to hate that I'm saying this, but it's a kind of filler-type game for me. I think if you're maybe new to gaming and you wanted to try something a little different, you could go with something like this. Um, but overall, for me, it was... It was fine. What are your thoughts there? Have you played it, Eric? No, I have not. I think Suze uh, talked about it with me and Tom a few episodes back. Right, exactly. Um, yeah. But I uh, no, I haven't had a chance to play. Yeah, I think I think there will be a lot of people this would fit into. Yeah, this is a, this is definitely something in my wheelhouse that I would play. Um, you know, within that hour playtime, and I think it would work well uh, for myself. I do tend to prefer something on the heavier side, but this game is still is still a good game for a lot of people. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you got to try it, and um, I think it will really appeal to fans of Critical Role and that whole world that they have. Um, I think that that's a great thing. Absolutely. 100%. So on to another game that I've played, Fast and Furious Highway Heist. I've been wanting to do this. I know. That sounds really good. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) So this is designed by Prospero Hall. There's no artist stated, and it's published by Funko Games. So this is a, I believe, a Target exclusive. Sorry, Canada and everyone else. Uh, And I think it retails for about $29.99 US. It plays two to four players in about 60 minutes. We're going to talk about the time momentarily. So it's a game that uh, is cooperative, uh, area movement, and uses action points in the game. So it's much like the movies. In the game, you're trying to leap from your vehicle, fight enemies, pull off stunts with plastic cars and stuff. But still, you can do all of these things. And you're trying to play based on a scenario. And there are three scenarios that come in the box. We uh, Initially, we've played through the first scenario, different difficulty levels. So we played on easy and normal. And you're trying to past certain checks and you're going to roll dice to do that. You're trying to take out cards, make them kind of uh, crash, turn upside down. So you can then use moves on cards later in the game to smash out the really 
big tank or truck that's in the middle of the board. And your goal is to try and take it out within a certain amount of turns. So that's going to be the way to win. If you don't take out the truck or tank, depending on the scenario that you're playing uh, by the end of the round, well, then we lose. So that's really the game. And you have several actions that you can take on a turn in order to do this and tokens that help assist you. You each have characters that you can kind of mash with a different type of car. So you're not stuck with the same character and same car. You can switch it up and they each give you different kinds of abilities uh, on the cards and it states it for you, which is really nice. I liked this game, but the first game was rough. Everybody, we played a two player of oh, this really? game. It was, was rough. Now, to be fair, we probably could have known the rules a little bit better, but it's really hard playing this game virtually, right? We're not, we didn't play it in person, so we played mm. it over online. I was managing the board, and the other person had the game as well, was managing their own stuff. And I found it was in the game, there are times where you actually need like a crash or a car to flip over and happen, so you can use that car to kind of smash it into. Um, the tank in order to damage it because well, there are cards. Fun. It's so fun. And you think it would be amazing, right? Like all the crashes smash it. But in our first game, I don't know if it's just something we did. We couldn't get crashes to happen or these cars to stay on the board because there are things that happen, which will remove those cars off the board. <laughs> and then if you don't have the cars, you're, you don't have anything to do damage with. You need them to be on there to do damage. So in our first game, we were lacking this and it could have been just something we did or didn't do. And it made it a like it was a bit of a struggle to get damage. And at that point, you're like, why are we even still playing this? <laughs> so, oh, interesting. That was our first game. And to be fair, a lot of that is on us. We probably could have done things a little bit better. But I feel like if there were more players, it may have been a slightly more chaotic board, so to speak. And you may have had more of those flipped cars to get that damage in. Hmm. The second game I played, again, was a two player. It went much better because I think we had a better grasp on the rules. We still didn't win, by the way. We played easy the first time, normal the second time. Um, so we were still able to balance out some of the cars there to do those crashes. But it still felt like something was missing a little bit for me. I, and this is where I feel like this is the type of game that you need to play at three or four. Just from some of the things that needed to be on the that, board that weren't okay, happening. That, I can see that being true, yeah. Yeah. It was fun, though. So let's be clear. Like, it was fun. And if you know the movies, you'll definitely get the vibe, like the theme. You know, with the boards, you know all the characters. They had a nice mix there. And each character has really fun abilities, depending on the, the one you chose. And I thought that was really cool. So if you knew the movie or didn't, you would still really enjoy it. The components were really fun. You know, because they had the plastic cars and they had the truck and the planes. And I thought they did that really well. And for the price point, that's really good. So I can't complain about that. So I definitely think for the price point, the type of game that it is, I could definitely see this being now when I say family, I'm not expecting young kids to be, you know, blowing stuff up and <laughs> smashing cars. <laughs> Unless they want but, to. Yeah, sure. I mean, hey, if parents are okay with it, that's totally fine, too. But I definitely think family higher player count, I think definitely would do really well with this game. And if you're a fan of the movie, I think you will also kind of get the nuances that are there. So fun game, but I definitely would recommend with three to four player versus two. Um, our game did not finish in 60 minutes. Now we were playing virtually that will add time, but I still think this game would take longer than 60 minutes to finish. Hmm. So there you go. So that is Fast and Furious Highway Heist. Now, I, I haven't seen this game in person. I've seen some pictures of these mm -hmm. neat pieces where you, you can take your figure and stick it on top of the vehicles. And yes. it looks looks really neat. How big is the scale? It's hard to tell that from the photos I've seen. Oh, so the cars are probably... So if you take your finger... You know, like there's a... From your nail bed to... Like your nail to your the first line on your finger. Uh-huh. That's probably about the size of the cars. Okay. Yeah, and then the tank would be two fingers together and then to the second line, and that's about the size of the tank. Oh. Yeah. So All that right. gives you an idea of the pieces, so, yeah. So first for me is is a game called The Independence Incident. Uh, last year, end of last year, Grand Gamers Guild came out with this, uh, it was a game called The Kringle Caper, as part of their Holiday Hijinks series. It's an 18-card escape room game uh, that comes in a little tuck box, and uh, that one was a Christmas-themed game. This is an Independence Day-themed game, which I guess is appropriate because we're recording this on the 4th of July. Um, it is by Jonathan Chafer and Grand Gamers Guild. 
So it's an 18-card deck that is a pretty linear puzzle adventure. Um, this particular one, the there's there's some sort of Americana um, mystery that, that you've been recruited to solve. And you will go from card to card solving little puzzles. Uh, there is an app that, that you will use that not only times you, but also you enter the... Uh, the answers for each card. So you'll be presented with a puzzle and you enter a an answer, a code, a code word into the, the web app and it tells you whether you can continue or if your answer is incorrect. And you work your way through the 18 cards. Huzzah, you win. Pretty simple. It's supposed to last about an hour. Uh, I did manage to get through in just over an hour. I think it was one hour and 22 seconds and it gave me full credit. So I guess it's it's okay. Um <laughs> I complained in the Kringle caper that um, there was no pause button in the web app, and they added that pretty soon after that. So this this current version has a pause button, so if the child runs into the room and needs something, you can pause it, and uh, and as long as you don't, you know, you're not cheating, uh, you can just come back to it and start the timer again when you when you come back to the game. Another neat thing, uh, there is a hint system, which I didn't need to use. I managed to get through this without any any hints. And even though it says it's a difficulty of three of three on the uh, the side of the of the deck, um, I didn't need uh, any any additional help. You're just that good. Eh? I know. well, this this is <laughs> puzzle master. <laughs> this is uh, definitely aimed at a family. Wait. In fact, it actually says one or more sleuths of any age. So it is designed so that younger players can also participate. Um, it does. There are a few puzzles that require outside knowledge. Um, the there are. I, I don't want to spoil it, but they. There are some things that that the information is outside the deck of cards. Um, that you that you may need to know, but the app gives you that as free hints, free reference material. There's like a little tab that you can hit that that's just information, and it lists Morse code. It lists um, the list of U.S. presidents. It lists a U.S. states list, a bunch of like hymns and uh, and other Americana pieces of information. Not all of which you'll need, but you may find useful in figuring out some of these puzzles, which I do appreciate. Um, I don't think that a family would have any real trouble working their way through this. It, you might not be able to do it in the hour, um, but you could certainly work your way through this with younger players, which I like. Uh, I did have a little trouble near the end with, with one of the final puzzles, which is good. You want to have sort of that ramping up. And um, I, I didn't think I was going to make it in the amount of time I had, but I, I managed to figure it out and, and come together and get all of the, uh, the pieces together. I do like uh, this series. I think it, it fills a niche that isn't necessarily filled. Uh, you see some of the exit games that are designed also at this level as sort of entry points. But this one's a nice casual, if you have a family holiday gathering uh, for like a 4th of July barbecue or a Christmas uh, get together, um, these things are, are nice to have. I did see they have a bundle on grandgamersguild.com for I think $18 for both of them. You can also get print and play versions for even less. Uh, so it's it's worth checking out as a sort of a one-off and, uh, and a nice little escape room experience. That is the Independence Incident from Grand Gamers Guild. Nice. Yeah, cool. Well, you knew you weren't going to escape an episode of the Dice Tower Podcast with Suzanne and Mandy without a roll and write game. Come on. <laughs> uh, I was hoping, not. but no. <laughs> ah, nice try, sucker. <laughs> we gotcha. <laughs> this week I wanted to talk about Varuna. Which just sounds so nifty. I like the name. <laughs> this is a sequel game to a another roll and write or card based roll and write called Demeter that we had talked about previously. The game is designed by Matthew Verdier, and the art in this one is by David Sibon, and it's published by Sorry We Are French. <laughs> And uh, you can pick it up for about 20 euro. Now, I ordered mine from Europe. It does not currently have North American distribution. And I actually talked to the designer a little bit. And Sorry We Are French was recently acquired by Hachette Board Games. Mm. And, I mean, Eric, Hachette should sound familiar to you with what you do as a career with the Yeah, Hachette Audiobook Audio reader. is, is significant uh, in the audiobook industry. Oh, wow. Well, apparently Hachette as an umbrella is moving into the board game um, sphere because they've purchased a few 
European based publishers very recently. Hmm. And I think there's hope that Hachette will make Demeter and Varuna available more easily outside mm. of Europe, which okay. personally I really hope for. Mm hmm. So as a sequel to Demeter, Varuna, Demeter was, you go to the moon of Demeter and you find dinosaurs on the <laughs> oh, moon. as one which does. is amazing. And Varuna continues that story, but this time now you're going into the oceans and you're discovering aquatic creatures. So you have a little submarine that you manage that can you can build up points in and it'll unlock special abilities. And now all of the dinosaurs that are arranged on the page are aquatic types. And overall, if you've played Demeter, Varuna will have a lot of nice elements that are very familiar. And just as a very quick overview of that, basically, there are six different types of cards, and you just shuffle each stack and then lay them out. And then you flip one from each pile. And then those are the actions you get to choose from. And you can play with as many people as you have sheets for. So maybe you choose the blue card. Okay, then you get the action and then you get a bonus action based on the blue color of the card. Actions are going to be like f discovering new dinosaurs, like coloring them in. They're literally these little outlines and you color them in and they have different icons on them and you, and you have to match those. Or maybe you are going to do a sonar action in Varuna. And there are these little lines, like red sonar lines, that you can kind of progress down. And then if you get to the end, it'll give you bonus scoring. Or maybe you're going to take a submarine action, and there's all the dinosaurs are connected by these dotted lines. And when you take a submarine action, you can fill in one of those lines to connect paths to discover different species of dinosaurs and that kind of thing. So you're just going to pick a card based on the action that you want to do, and fill it in, and then take the bonus action. Bob's your uncle. But one of the things that both Demeter and Varuna do so well is there's so many combos, right? As you do this sonar action, oh, look, you crossed off that bonus action. Okay, now you get to take that bonus seashell action. Oh, now that I did that bonus seashell action, that's actually going to get me uh, another sonar action. So I'm going to do this sonar action over here and discover this dinosaur, that kind of thing. So it's got that satisfying combo engine building thing that you find in a lot of roll and write games that I like, like Hadrian's Wall or uh, Ganshan Clever. The game plays in 13 rounds, so it's very predictable from a pacing point of view. And the look of the game is really, really cool, too. I just like the aesthetics of the game overall. One thing that Varuna also adds, so there's some elements like the pathing and things like that that are unique to Varuna compared to Demeanor. It adds damage. So you're diving in this submarine. Well, you know, things happen. And now when cards are flipped over, if there is a damage icon on a card and you don't choose it, your submarine can actually take damage that will result in negative points. And that adds so much tension to the choices. I really liked that addition. Now, one of the people I played with, they were kind of iffy on whether or not they liked the damage. But personally, I really enjoyed it. I thought it upped the tension. I think Demeter and now Varuna are just some of my favorite in this genre. I love them. And I was so excited about Varuna when... I heard it was announced. I just had to get my grubby hands as soon as it was possible. And as a sequel to Demeter, it 100% lives up to it. It offers something fresh while keeping the things that you loved about Demeter. It adds some interesting tension. The other thing it really adds that I love is one of my favorite things about Demeter is that you choose how you score. You have to earn the elements that you get to score. And Runa kept that previously in Demeter, you would unlock endgame scoring. Now in Varuna, when you unlock the scoring, you score it as soon as you unlock it. And so it adds an extra timing element that was just fabulous as well. So if you like a chunkier, more complex roll and write, if you want that roll and write experience, but you, it works your brain a little bit extra, Demeter's a great one. Varuna is a phenomenal follow-up. I love it a lot. And I'm really, really, really hoping that Hachette Board Games brings it to North America so that everyone can play it and get it because it's wonderful. Hmm. That's Varuna. Hmm. I hope they bring this here because I have Demeter, which I really enjoy. So thanks for that, Suze. Another one to add to the list. So should I wait or should I just order it from Europe? I mean... <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not going to tell you what to do. All right, I'll order it. I see what you're putting down there. <laughs> I'm going to wait. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I know Suzanne has been waiting so long to talk about this because I think you have a copy, Suzanne. You haven't played yet. Now I feel I bad. I got it to the table yet, so I'm jealous. I'm sorry. There is a solo bad. mode. Yeah. Oh, th- thank you. Eric. That's right. Solo mode. And this is what I will be talking about today, the solo mode. And you're all waiting. What game? Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition. Now, before you all say something, because I know what you're thinking. It's a space game? That. <laughs> and I have some <laughs> feelings about Terraforming Mars, the original game. So we are definitely going to get into that a little bit. So this is designed by Sidney Engelstein, Jacob and help me here, Frick Celius? That's as close as I've been able to get. Okay. And Nick Little. Art is by William Bricker, Isaac Frick Celius, Garrett Keda, and Jason D. Kingsley. And it's published by Frick's Games and Stronghold Games. I believe this is a Target exclusive? Or you this can get it at Target? This edition is, yes. This edition. Thank you. And that it's a $39.99 US. And uh, yeah. So, Terraforming Mars, Ares Expedition. First thing I have to note, and you're going to be like, this is silly. It is in a much smaller box. Bigger, wider, but smaller. We'll get to that in a second. (laughs) So it's important for me because the other one's pretty big. Terraforming Mars. This is an engine building game for those who are not familiar with the game. And it does remain that way in this uh, version. And you're buying cards and resources to help terraform Mars. That is literally the game. Now, there are a few things that happen within that. In this version of the game, you have three things you need to do to win. You need to raise the heat the heat of Mars to an acceptable level, and it's right up there. Add enough oxygen to Mars, and you're going to do some planting of trees and other ways to get it there. And you're going to add water to Mars, and we have some tiles that are on the board that need to be flipped, and all of them need to be flipped. So you need to do all three of these things in order to win. I'm going to tell you right now, I have yet to win. <laughs> so there's lots more playtime for me here. Um, so it can be done, but it can be a little tricky. So it definitely has similarities to the original Terraforming Mars. And the biggest difference in this game is that you only get to execute one phase of the game per turn. I think in the original, there are five. So in this particular game, each player have a set of cards and they are listing all of the phases on the cards, and you're going to choose which phase you would like to do. So, for example, in a two-player game, I would pick a card, and then the other player would pick a card. Now, those are the two phases, or sorry, the two things that are going to happen. So one could be development, I'm doing this off the top of my head, and one could be a different type of phase. You're going to, each player is going to do all the phases, but you get the bonus phase, or the bonus portion of the card on your card. So there's a top part of the card, which will say developmental phase or something like that. And then on the bottom, it'll say you get a discount when you develop XYZ. You will be the only person that gets to that bottom portion of that card, but you get to do the top portion of everybody else's card. That's it. And then within that, you're hoping that someone doesn't have the same card that you've chosen because you don't get to do it twice. It just ends up being that one thing that you get to do. So this is where it gets tricky. So because I played it solo, you still have to flip a card for the other quote unquote person. And that's as much upkeep that you're going to do. And you have a card that you're going to flip and you're still going to do both of the cards that come up, but you still get your bonus action on your card. So development, construction, action, production, research. These are some of the things that you can do. And I believe some of those are very similar in uh, in the original game. That's it. And like I said, the three conditions I mentioned at the beginning are what you need to win. If not, well, you don't. All that being said, I liked this better than the original Terraforming Mars. All right. I just found it. I like Suzanne's word these days. It was snappier. (laughs) I just found the original Terraforming Mars far too long for what it is. It was just when I sit in a game and I'm like, oh, my goodness, is this over yet? That's not good. I wanted it to be over in the original. This one, I was like, okay, this is great. Like, I I felt invested in the game. And I felt like, oh, I was like looking. Oh, my goodness. I have so many rounds to do X, Y, Z. That's good to me. Because now I'm into it. I didn't get that from the original one. This this game also allows you to discard cards anytime to get three. And it's MC. Sorry. It's uh, credits. It's the money in this game. The money credits or master credits or something. 
Yes, thank you, Eric. Exactly that. I like that. Because the biggest thing for me, and this is just saying how great of a player I am, ha, not, uh, I was always so <laughs> short on credits in the original game, so it wasn't fun for me. Sure, that may have been on me, but I just felt like it was really hard to get that, especially if other players were producing so much, and I'm like, this is a struggle. And it was really hard to get back from that. In this game, I love the fact that you can get rid of a card, woo, maybe get some credits, so I can actually afford things. So. Mm-hmm. That, to me, was good. It wants you to succeed. The temperature and oxygen tracks are color-coded. I don't know if they were in the original. Sorry, I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, I think so. Okay. There's, like a, the pre- a, there's zones. There's like a purple zone, a red zone, a yellow zone. Okay, so there you go. So that's something I can actually appreciate in both games. I like that. And then it shows you on the card. So I don't know if the original did that, but on the card, it will actually show you where it falls in the zones. So not only is the board color-coded, color-coded to match the cards, which I thought was really nice. Uh, I mentioned shorter playtime. I'm all about it. Yes, I love a good, crunchy, long game when it needs to be that way. Terraforming Mars is a game to me that does not need to be that long. I'm sorry. Mm. So this to me, uh, yeah, I'm going to say like it is. (laughs) This game for me was great. It plays in about an hour, I think, maybe, give or take, uh, when I played it solo. And that's just because, you know, I was thinking, taking my time, doing stuff. Because I think it ends up being like 25 rounds or something or 25 turns. 25 turns. Turns. Thank you. 25 turns. So it sounds like a lot, but I feel like the turns go relatively quickly, which I'm here for. There are some things that I'm concerned, like the um, resources on the on your board, I guess you could call it, because it's not really a board. It's almost like a thick piece of cardstock, I guess. So that, <laughs> okay. I mean, sure. that's a board. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I would have preferred <laughs> it to be a little nicer, but for the price point, and I get it. Um, but if you knock sure. it, like it's off, like it's it's gone. You're going to have to now, this is where you have to go back, which is a good thing, I guess. You can go through your cards and see, okay, this, you know, I had three of this, two of this, and you can readjust your tracks. But I bump the table a lot. I'm sorry. I'm klutzy. And I'm, a lot of the times I'm knocking stuff and have to go back and kind of figure it out. So it can be a little fiddly in that respect. So I do wish that that was a little bit different, maybe better boards, but I understand for the price point. Lastly, and this kind of falls, I guess, with the first one, why at Target? <laughs> <laughs> It just excludes it for, it's just really hard for us. Not to say that we can't get it in Canada and Australia and other places, but I think this is a game that should be shared with everybody. So I'm hoping that this gets more widely distributed. And I don't know, maybe I could be wrong. It should be. Okay. So there is a Target edition. Yep. Got it. But then there is a hobby edition as well. Oh, yes. fantastic. And okay, one of the so. chief differences is that player board. So the Target exclusive edition, which is out now, uh, yes. has very thin player boards and single layer player boards that if you bump them, the cubes are right. going to go places. But the Kickstarter slash hobby edition, which is still upcoming, right, has dual layer boards with little tracks that keep your cubes from getting bumped if you, uh, if you hit the table. Okay, so I have the version without that. So for me, I if I would pay the extra to get the boards that hold everything in and track it that way. I prefer that. So thank you for that. I actually didn't know that. So there you go. So I guess that could be now a good thing in the other version. So if you don't like that for the version that I have, then at least you have an option. So sorry, that was very long, but I feel like I had to really go in depth here because I know people are going to come for me about terraforming Mars. <laughs> and I had to have all my ducks in a row. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like this game a lot. Uh, I, I think I agree with with uh, the stuff that you said. It is snappier. I'll use Suzanne's mm-hmm. word as well. Um, <laughs> it, I, I like uh, how you have to trigger stuff like production. Uh, the the yes. income phase requires an action. Some player needs to say that's what's happening this turn. It's not right. just an automatic thing that happens every turn like it does in the Big Brother board game. Uh-huh. Um, and, and you know it has it has a vibe of of say a race for the galaxy or Puerto Rico. It's yes. that same mechanism where you have to look at what the other players are going to do. Maybe I don't want to spend my chosen action on something I know somebody else. If somebody else is going to choose production because I know they're really short on money, uh-huh. I'm not going to choose production. I'm going to choose something else, right. um, and hopefully get more done because I've chosen the correct action. I. I I like that idea. The solo game is cool. Um, it does go 25 turns. The first 20 are random, what the other player does, the dummy player chooses. Right. But exactly. in the last five, you get to choose the order in which your dummy player chooses its five actions. Mm-hmm. And so you can sort of do that last push to make sure things trigger in the order that you want to try and get uh, get everything terraformed. Exactly that. So 
I don't know. See, Eric likes it. I like it. Suzanne, I'm next to positive. You are also going to I can't wait to this. try it. So everybody, Terraforming Mars, Aries Expedition. Next for me is a solo game uh, called Under Falling Skies. It's from Tomas Allier uh, and CGE, Czech Games Edition. I feel like, I think Mandy talked about this. Did you talk about this, Mandy? A little bit. I have it, and I played it with um, Paul Grogan and Calvin, actually. We played it on a stream, and I did talk about it a little bit, but okay. not as in-depth. So, yes, please, say all the things. And I talked about it, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, it's uh, it goes for $30 US MSRP. You can find it a little less on some of the online sites. Uh, it is, like I said, an only solo game. Um, you, it's, it's sort of like Space Invaders. You've got a bunch of, of uh, alien ships coming down in columns on this long board that's modular. Um, there are, there's a basic game, and then there's scenario-based uh, situations that you can put together. But these, these segments of the board that create a column of, of ways that these, uh, these alien ships are going to come down toward your, your city. Um, and then below that, you've got a bunch of action spaces, some of which are available from the very beginning and others you're going to have to unlock over the course of the game. It's a dice allocation game. So you will, at the beginning of a round, roll your five dice. Some are gray. I think three of them are gray. Two of them are white. And then you will place those on the action spaces that are in your city. Um, you can only place one in each of the five columns, however. So once I place one in, in column two... Even if there's a really useful place for, for another column two room for me to activate, I can't activate it. Um, I, I can only choose one in each column. Every time I place a die, the ships in that column are going to move forward the value of that die, which can also trigger abilities. It can have them change columns. It can have them move the mothership farther down so that the danger is now closer. Other nasty stuff can happen uh, as these things come down. But I'm also trying to get them on places where they can be shot down. There are specific spots on the board that are little ship explody spaces. And um, I'm trying to get them there <laughs> so that one of the rooms I can place dice on is is like guns, is, is fighter jets that can, can take these things down. And if I have enough pips on the die that matches the space that those alien ships are on, when I activate that room, I can take out those ships and they go back to the mothership to, to come back. We're safe for now. Um, I can also spend actions to, to excavate more rooms because there's more, more powerful rooms cooler rooms farther on down. Some rooms need two or more dice to activate, so I have to really plan my actions. Every time I play a white die, I re-roll all of my remaining dice, so that's another uh, thing to juggle. And, you know, if I don't, if I don't want my, if I want to use the values I have on the table, I don't want to place a white die because I have to re-roll everything. Yep. It's very puzzly. Uh, which is good for a solo game to, to work out all of the ramifications. But often you placing a die in a particular spot will move a ship. It will also activate that room. It will also possibly cost you energy, uh, which is what you need to activate many of these rooms. And if you don't have the energy you need to activate the room, when you activate the room, you're not going to activate the room. You're also <laughs> you're also trying to research. There's a big research track. You have to get all the way up this research track to win the game. And that is also a room action that you are activating, which doesn't seem to be all that important, at least in the beginning of the game, as you're trying to shoot down the ships and, and manage, like many uh, cooperative or single-player games, you're trying to manage the fires, but you're also trying to reach the end of the game. And you have to keep in mind reaching the end of the game because at some point that mothership's going to be so close you can't do anything about it. It's going to cause the end of the game. And if you haven't reached the top of that research track, you're done. Uh, and that's certainly what happened to me in my, my first play. I got a chance to play this a year, I mean, two, two something years ago in like prototype form at one of the Dice Tower cons. Oh, cool. And enjoyed it. Uh, but I, this is the first time I've gotten to play the full version um, I, I was destroyed. I looked up and suddenly went, oh, the mothership is almost going to kill me. And I'm still like eight <laughs> spaces away on the research track. Um, there is, as I said, a scenario sequence, which um, bring up, you know, different cities and, and you have um, characters that have special abilities and other stuff that gets unlocked. They've packed it in the box such that you, you pull out the components for the basic game, play that a few times, and then when you start the scenarios, you actually open up a packet for each uh, of your missions, which is kind of cool. They tell you literally, don't, don't dig 
don't go any farther down the box. Just play with the basic stuff until you're ready to begin the scenarios. I, I liked it. This is a cool challenge. Um, it's a heavy box with all that cardboard in there. Yeah, it's um, packed. And I'm, I'm excited to work my way through those scenarios. It's, it's a really cool game. Takes up, I was trying to play this while watching TV on a, uh, a coffee table. And it, because the, the game is so long, I had to do it yeah. sideways. But that's fine. <laughs> um, so, so be aware of your table space. It's, over, it's like a pinball machine. You have to like yeah. have a long alley uh, right. of table space ready to play. Still, Under Falling Skies is very cool. If you're looking for a solo experience, as many of us are these days, um, it's, a, it's a lovely one to explore. I like this one, and and I, I I liked playing it with other people. I do that sometimes with solo games. We'll play it more as a group, making decisions, uh, and it works really well for that. So hmm. I really liked it. Yeah, definitely big thumbs up. And to wrap up games played, um, we were just talking earlier about expansions and whether or not they made sense. I'm going to talk about an expansion, and that's the Shifting Seasons expansion for Villagers. I've been a big fan of Villagers for a long time. It's got this thing where you're drafting cards that are Villagers and you're building up your village and they chain off of each other. So you're building almost a little engine in front of you, a card engine, where if you have a a miner, then you can add a digger on top of it that will unlock another card that if you can draft that you can get you a lot of points by the end of the game this is designed by Hawken Gardner and the art is also by Hawken which you know too much talent in one person is just not fair (laughs) and it's published by Sinister Fish Games Now, I think that this is actually on Kickstarter right now from an expansion point of view. The Villagers was published a couple of years ago. And I think the expansion's like 13 pounds. And, you know, Villagers is one of those games that first appealed to me aesthetically. And then I got it to the table and I was just charmed by it. I love the way the card combos work. I like the way that you have to pay attention to what other people are doing because you can key off of some of their people in their villages as well, which I thought was a really cool element. And it's one of these games that just keeps on coming back to the table because it's fun and it's engaging and it doesn't overstay its welcome. Although arguably sometimes you felt like it was a little too short. And that's one of the first things that Shifting Seasons addresses that I was so happy to see. They've lengthened the game by essentially a round. Hmm. And that was one of the things in Villagers. Like you would just feel like you were just getting that engine moving and then the game would be over. Ugh. And here comes Shifting season. So they've added a suit. Uh, the suits are things like, of course, I'm going to forget, like wine and ore and things like that. And now they've added a clay suit. So you've made the deck bigger and the way that they allocate cards to the draft piles has changed a little bit. Also that the game can last one more round so that you can really feel that engine kick off. And I think that that is a brilliant move and I love that they did that. They also added seasons cards and there's three per season, but you only play with one that you choose randomly. So there's a little bit of variability built in there. And now when you lay out the card row, there was two scoring cards that would get inserted up there. Now you spread the four season cards between those. So as each stack is drained, something is going to trigger, whether it's a season card or whether it's a scoring card. And I love them. The season cards are almost always positive. Now, sometimes they're more positive if you've optimized to take advantage of it. Like, oh, now all these types of villagers get a gold on them or... Uh, You can activate a chain of a villager twice all the way down both sides. And so, sure, you may do better than somebody else at it, but I like that they're mostly positive. I think that's actually super duper fun. And you can kind of activate that engine that you've been working on, which is part of the fun of the game. They also added new unique cards that are really, really powerful, that are fun to get to. And the way that the unique cards work is you never know what you're going to get with these unique cards. So sometimes you can really pull them off and sometimes you can't. But I like that addition. The final thing that they changed, well, not the final thing, but the final thing I'll mention here 
is they changed the solo mode. So previously you had this solo mode called the Countess. And I don't know how to say this nicely. <laughs> I don't like the Countess. Okay. I liked the solo game, but I really hated the Countess because the solo game was so hard. The Countess is mean. Oh my goodness. <laughs> So now you have a monastery as a solo mode. And depending on what kind of solo player you are, you can still play with the Countess, or now you can choose to play with the monastery solo mode instead. And this monastery solo mode really appeals to me. And Mandy, mm. if if you don't mind doing the card setup, like the card row setup, yeah. this is the kind of solo you would like. Because all you have to do is it, mitigates the draft it right. helps winnow cards out of the row that you know to take them away from you and there's a very simple priority list of how you take those cards off the row really clean really simple and that's it you don't have to manage their tableau or anything like that or fake it it's just remove cards from the market according to this scale that they provide done and then play your game nice. and build your engine and try to maximize your score hmm. it's way more relaxing than the Countess mode. And I really have enjoyed it. Oh. So that's my, uh, hmm, I don't know if it's, I think my favorite thing about Shifting Seasons is the way that it expands the game length, but really close up there is I really am enjoying this solo mode as well. Hmm. So if you are a fan of Villagers, and I say this carefully, I really, I really do get the trouble with expansions. I think... Shifting Seasons is a must-have. If you like Villagers, if you love Villagers, I would look at picking up the expansion. The way it expands the game, the extra suit, those new unique cards, it, it just, the seasons, it adds a lot to the game. The yeah. game's still the same, but the things that it adds just elevates the experience. Hmm. And hey, if you haven't played Villagers... I recommend it. I really, I've enjoyed this game for years. I still make sure it gets to my table. And now with this new solo mode, I'm actually going to be probably be playing it more. So um, check that out. If a little drafting, tableau building with really cool stylistic art is your thing. Villagers. I haven't uh, played the original. So uh, now now you've <gasps> interested me to at least try it out. Uh, you know, oh gosh, maybe I want to teach it to you so much. <laughs> Maybe this expansion, because, you know, I, I liken expansions to sequels to movies. You know, there are some some movies <laughs> that do not need an expansion because it was chef's kiss, wonderful. And then sometimes, you know, you get a sequel and it's like they just put everything in it. It's all over. It's too much. And you're like, why? Why did that even happen? So you're saying to me, sure. this is a nice, a nice addition. The expansion. A hundred percent. Okay. Yep. I'm here for it. Don't tell Seuss. I haven't played it either. But <laughs> it's going to make a noise. <laughs> okay, no, you know what? I see this as an opportunity, not not to shame you, my dear friends, but an opportunity to find a time where we can play it together because I think there's like a virtual, like a, t a oh. digital version that we can play like on TTS or something. I'll double check, but huh. I, would, I would love to teach you. Yes, I'm here for it. All right. It's pie time, folks. Pie Woo! time. Mm. Pie time. On or up. <laughs> oh, Eric, I love having you on the show. The Op is a one-stop shop for game night. With games for friends and family, you can create your next game night memory with The Op. With new party games for the game group like Hughes and Cues, everyone will have a great time around the table. Hughes and Cues is a new game night classic, generational for the whole family. Check out the Op.Games website with games for everyone, from the pop culture geek, mom and dad, and your friends too. And guess what? We have a new promo code, exclusive for Dice Tower listeners. 10% off entire purchases at the Op.Games. It's available on all games, puzzles, and accessories. Free shipping available on purchases for $49 or more. It's available for U.S. residents only, and the code is Dice Tower. Order up! And now, it's time to order up a slice of Game Pie. Oh boy, Game Pie is a, an interesting one today. It's like Game Pie plus tax. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I like, I mean, this was an interesting uh, restriction. Yeah, we're, we're talking about games with an MSRP of $15 or lower. And Suzanne, you said U.S. dollars uh, when, when you set this up. And MSRP, which does bring up some interesting difficulties. Mm-hmm. As I was exploring a few games that I thought would fit, um, these there are some games that may be available at an online retailer or at your your you know the discount shelf of your uh, FLGS for less than fifteen dollars, but the MSRP has quietly been creeping up for some of these. I, I noticed the uh, the Flux games over the past couple of years have gone up. The MSRP used to be fifteen dollars, and it is for some of the older titles, but some of the newer ones are now sixteen, seventeen, maybe eighteen. Um, and it's it's while you may still be able to find them for less than fifteen, that MSRP is no longer where you thought it was. I definitely noticed that. You know, especially in today's world of increasing materials cost and increasing freight cost, I'm I'm not surprised to hear that, and I'm not going to be surprised to see retail prices having to go up to no. accommodate kind of the cost of making games really going up a lot. When you think about it. Prices haven't had a major increase in 30 years. Yeah. I mean, we've seen scope creep increasing prices, but not necessarily just, you know, ticket to ride costs the same 20 years ago right. that it costs today. And I, it, I it think costs more to make. A lot ways. of companies, if they haven't already started this process, are doing so now. It, it's, it's just you can't, you, ha- you can't hold, you can only hold the line for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and at Absolutely. some point, this this has to uh, to change a little bit and and we've seen you know the quietly going up a dollar or two in the MSRP so you see like MSRP of thirty three dollars which is sort of yeah. a weird number um, but that's <laughs> right. probably a result of this sort of thing right and I think that all of us who are super into this hobby know board games is an expensive hobby <laughs> it can get that you know, way even, for sure even before prices <laughs> creeping up yep. It's a luxury hobby, and I think that it would be it, – it's just nice to take a step back every once in a while and recognize that there are truly excellent games yes. that don't have to cost you $40, 50 60 80 $120. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. There are truly excellent games at those price points too. Yeah. But sometimes it's nice to remind ourselves that people are making wonderful games that are very affordable. Yep. Now – The other thing I wanted to bring up before we get into the pie, I find the way lower cost games are ranked on Board Game Geek interesting. Mm. Okay. Because they aren't. Hmm. Right? So normally when we do pies or lists, I'll go to the geek and let's say we're doing, you know, best game from 2005, Right. right? I'll go do my little search and just start scanning the games. And, oh, I like that one. Oh, I like that one. Oh, I like this one. So for this list, I just loaded up the Board Game Geek ranked games list and started scrolling. And you got to go through mm-hmm. these these pages of search results before you find a less expensive game. Yeah. You got to go through that list a lot before a simple card game right. shows up on the list. Yep. And I think that's really interesting. I think, you know, there's 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 been discussion before about what kind of people really actively use Board Game Geek and really rank games and all that other element that that sure. drives those those rankings. And I I never really thought about how lower cost games or these kind of sometimes simple car games um, might struggle to get recognized in that particular fashion. Yeah, uh, just based on how that system works and the people, how it kind of self-selects. They do sort of have the advantage of being closer to, I don't want to make any assumption about what an impulse buy would be for someone, but Mm -hmm. it it is easier to add on a $15 game to an order that you're making already or to be at a register at your FLGS and say, oh, that looks, that looks interesting. Oh, it's only $12. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's add that. Let's, let's take the plunge and take a chance on this game. So it does have that advantage, whereas you'd be far more hesitant to do that with a $50 or $60 game. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a good point. Mm-hmm. All right, enough lead up. Let's start serving up some slices. Mandy, why don't you kick us off? Well, my slices are going to be in um, Canadian dollars or <clears throat> with Canadian cheddar. Let's uh, go with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
<laughs> so you all know what that means. There's going to be a little extra here, but uh, I'll explain momentarily. So the first game on my list is, well, the general exit games, which mm. retail for about $14 Canadian and plus the dreaded tax. <laughs> so technically still 15 but we got to we got to say that cuz i know my canadians will be all up on my social media going mandy you forgot the tax. Yeah. <laughs> uh, exit games, really fun. If you haven't played them, they're very similar to the exit rooms. You have try to solve the mystery within a certain amount of time. And well, you get to destroy some things, which is could be fun. <laughs> and Pharaoh's Tomb is one that I played that I really enjoyed. But there are tons of others uh, that are quite fun. So exit, $14 plus tax. I'm glad you have Exit on your list. Uh, I was considering putting the different escape room games because not only is Exit under the $15, mm-hmm. but uh, the single deck unlocks, the the earlier uh-huh. unlock games are, are under that, and the deckscape games are under that threshold oh, nice. as well. I'd recommend all three. Perfect. I'm beginning my list with a game called The Crew, the cooperative trick-taking game from Cosmos. Lovely game, especially if you have fans of trick-taking games. Um, A nice twist on that genre. And I promise not everything is going to be a simple card game because I I actively tried. I could have gone with all simple card games. um, But but The Crew, I couldn't just ignore that one. So we're going in. Nice. I like that one. Suzanne taught me that one. Really fun. I really enjoyed that one. And hey, you know, nothing wrong with a good card game because yeah. I love card games. <laughs> First up for me, and a number of games could fit under this, uh, but I'll say Circle the Wagons. Mm-hmm. This is going to retail in the U.S. for 12 bucks. This is one of the button-shy wallet games, and basically all of their games yep. are under that $15 yes. threshold, and many of them are are quite good. The other, I really debated between Circle the Wagons and Sprawlopolis. That would have been my mm, pick, but yeah. That's a good one, yeah. Right. So uh, either one of those, they've got just great gameplay in a very small, very portable, very affordable package. I love them both. Uh, they've got expansions to them, but I think, you know, it's still, they're still incredibly affordable, even if you were to add the expansions, especially for the volume, like just the, the gameplay that you get out of them, the replayability in, in terms of just keeping your interest game between games and uh, keeping a wide variety of players interested in the gameplay. Uh, Circle the Wagons. That is a good one. I have a lot of those games, but I, you know what? I don't think I've played that one. It's on the pile, so I definitely need to oh, so good. Hmm. I love push it. it up there. So Okay. Well... The next one, I like to to live on the edge of danger here. So Castles of Burgundy, the dice game, which retails for fourteen ninety five. So <laughs> Just squeaked it in. Just got it in there. And I, I love the original game, but I, I also find the dice game is still just as robust as the original, obviously in a smaller box, you know, shorter time play. But I really, well, you know, it's a felt. Of course, I'm going to love it. But uh, the dice game is quite good. And it's one that's, well, portable, which will be a fun thing, hopefully, going forward for a lot of people. So there you go. I almost put Castles of Burgundy, the card game, on oh. on my list, which uh, retails for 14 U.S. That one is a little less po- – well, it's, it's portable because it's in a small box, right. but it takes up a good amount of table it, space. A huge amount of table space. More than you think. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's, there's a lot of game in that small box, so that Absolutely. would also – I'd also recommend that one. Good choice, yeah. Uh, my next selection is Hey, That's My Fish. Uh, there have been many – or versions of Hey, That's My Fish, some of which do not fit this threshold. They're they're larger, they have more elaborate pieces, but Fantasy Flight came out with a very small box version, uh, which has the little penguins, uh, penguin miniatures, and I think maybe smaller tiles as well. It's almost marketed to kids, but this is a lovely family weight abstract game that can appeal to adults as well. It can be very cutthroat as you're moving your penguins around and trying to cordon off chunks of the ice flow and grabbing these fish uh, and, and you know, sort of making this chunk is mine and, and you can't get it. Um, it. It can be very cutthroat and a lot of fun, but still accessible for these younger players. Uh, there's a lot of game in here. Hey, that's my fish for just 13 bucks for the Fantasy Flight version. I've never played this game. I hear so much about it and I have never played it. Has it been around for a while or is it a yeah, new game? Yeah, it's charming. I, I want to say 10 years at least. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. maybe I need to try this then. Next up for me, Ohanami. Eric was saying, oh, he's going to avoid a bunch of card games, but I, I did not put that <laughs> restriction on myself. Ohanami is 
a wonderful card game by Stefan Bendorf. It's published in North America from Pandasaurus. And Pandasaurus, interestingly, has a number of card games in that $15 or lower mm, range. Yes. And I, I love that they've added that to their product line. But Ohanami is a personal favorite where you've got this big deck of cards and they have like f- their pink, gray, or blue, or green, four different suits. And ultimately, what you're trying to do is arrange them in gardens. The art is gorgeous. You've got gray as this beautiful rock garden and green for like foliage and pink for the blossoms. And you're trying to arrange these cards in ascending order, but you can't tuck in, right? You always just have to feed, grow from the top or the bottom of the three gardens or mm-hmm. the three columns that you have to work with. And you score differently each round. So the first round you score one color. The second round you score that color again And a new color. And the third round, you score those two colors again. And so, you know, the first one you score has a huge impact. That scaled scoring, the play restriction with the columns, the beauty of the art, everything comes together for just a fabulous, really clever, really rewarding card game experience. And that's why Ohanami had to make my pie. Also in this same line is uh, Illusion from Pandasaurus, which I think is a oh, nice yeah. little... It doesn't get talked about as much, but a, a same same price point and uh, some neat, neat gameplay in there. Yeah, definitely. Good choices. Next on my list is a bit of... Well, no, it's a party game. <laughs> and <laughs> it's uh, Anomia. And uh, this one comes in at fourteen ninety five Canadian. And uh, this one is fun. It makes you really like, oh, you know that when you're, something's on the tip of your tongue, this game does that. You know, you're playing a card with a symbol and has a word, uh, has a, it's a symbol on it, and then there's a word, and you have to come up with a word, kind of describe that, and then someone else is doing it at the same time, but you're trying not to look at their card and your card. Oh my goodness, it's so much when you're doing this game. And then when they're the same, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, you have to do it before the person, and oh, it's just wild. And I know it's a card game. But it's a fun one. (laughs) I know. Now Eric has got me thinking. Eric has put so much pressure (laughs) on me. Pressure. It's I'm having that anomia moment now because of the pressure, Eric. I'm kidding. So anomia for me is a fun one. If you haven't tried it, even if you're not into party party games, this is not one that gets well, it gets silly, but not stupid, if that makes sense. So (laughs) it's a very clever one. (laughs) I think I think you should give it a whirl. So there you go, Anomia. You know, I never said I was going to avoid all card games. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Next on my list is Oh My Goods, uh, oh, is. which which is a, a deep uh, engine building game using this deck of cards, multi-use cards. So these things act as mm-hmm. sort of an event deck and resources and buildings and workers and all sorts of stuff, uh, all using this same deck of cards. Um, there's a solo mode. There's all sorts of great gameplay in here. And yeah, if you go past the $15 threshold, there are expensive expansions that can add to the game as well. But just in the base game, Oh My Goods is great value for its $15 price point. I wanted this on my list, but everybody, it's uh, 1995 Canadian, so no. I, couldn't, I couldn't make it happen, but I'm glad to see it on Eric's list. You knew I had to put at least one roll and write game in my mm-hmm. $15 game pie. And the one I chose is Metro X. Ah, nice. I... I guess I felt some kind of pressure in a weird way to emphasize that games that were more affordable could still be really deep. Yeah. They aren't just, and not to denigrate party games, Mm -hmm. because I love party games too, but I wanted to, to make sure that we were communicating that. A game doesn't have to be expensive to provide a really fulfilling, rewarding game experience. And Metro X is one of my absolute all-time favorite top five roll and write games, period. It's card-based, and it was originally published only in Japan, and I was really excited that it finally got brought over to the U.S. by GameRight. And GameRight has it in stores for $15, wow. $14.95 uh, U.S. MSRP, and I love it. They've included enough components in there for up to six players, which is lovely. And again, this is one where you're flipping cards and then you have to connect different routes to try to reach different stations to maximize on your score. And for just such a simple concept, the play itself works out to be quite clever and quite challenging to really do great. And you're going to see wildly different scores in the same game based on what choices people make as the cards flip over. There's a little bit of a push your luck element to it. 
I love Metro X. I am so glad that Game Right picked it up and made it super affordable so all of us can pick it up and enjoy it at home. This is nice. I have this one. Play it a lot. So definitely one you should all give a whirl. Last one on my list here is Quicks. It's a roll and ride. I'm so proud of you, man. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I had to get one in there at least. And this one comes in a really cute box. I like this one. It has that little flip up lid with the magnetic. Little flap, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was really cute. And I also have the app. So I play this game actually a lot. And uh, just quickly, roll and write. You've got rows of numbers in different colors matching the dice. And they go in a numerical order, I guess you could say. And what you want to do is try to cross off numbers um, that are not too far down the list because you can't go back. And you want to try and cross off as many as you can, you know, to get those points in the end. So... Generally, that's what it is. It's tricky little game, and uh, I still don't think I'm particularly good at it, but I still enjoy it. So Quicks is one that I feel like it's, I was going to say like a granddaddy of of roll and rights. But... Absolutely. I would definitely yeah. agree. <laughs> yeah, it's been around for a while, and then there's a reason for that. So Quicks, it's a good one. Check it out. Yeah, my family likes this one as well. I was actually surprised that we didn't see more roll and rights on the list, but many of the roll and rights are mm-hmm. past this threshold. They're mm-hmm. more like a $20 MSRP, uh, especially like the whole line of Stronghold uh, role and rights, including Gonshaw Clever. Which are all Clever. great. Yeah, which right. are great, yeah. but they are beyond this $15 price point. So that's it's, yeah. it's nice that you were, you were able to get a few onto onto the list. Oh, and sorry, I don't know if I said the price. thirteen ninety five Canadian. There you go. My last selection is... Ultra Tiny Epic Galaxies, which comes in. I cannot believe. I I mean, I just got to take a moment here. Golf clap, yes, Eric. That was yeah. very well done. Golf clap for you figuring this one out. I'm impressed. Uh, it, it goes for $15, which is about half the price of its, of its original Big Brother uh, cousin. It's the same game, the same basic edition of Tiny Epic Galaxies, which is a, a dice rolling action selection game uh, that keeps everybody involved throughout the different turns as you're colonizing planets and taking actions on those planets, flying your spaceships all around this this row of of planets and locations and stuff. Um, Lovely gameplay that the way they miniaturize it is by using wooden cubes for the dice as opposed to full-size dice. Um, but it it fits in a little tuck box, and it's the it's the gameplay of the original game for fifteen bucks. Ultra wow. tiny epic galaxies. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Oh, it's me. <laughs> I like, was like waiting for me. <laughs> okay. She was so enthralled by your, your just, story yeah, and your I'm, selection. I'm almost angry at you for figuring that one out. It was so good. <laughs> Which just means I'm envious because I didn't think of it. Uh. <laughs> right. For our last slice of affordable games, Game Pie, Six Nymphed, mm-hmm. otherwise known as Take Five. And this just reaches that $15 mark. Super affordable card game. Six Nymphed is one of those games that's got a great player count. You can play up to six out of the box. And you're going to get a hand of cards. And you've got these rows. And you're just trying to you simultaneously select a card from your hand, put it face down, flip it, reveal it. And then you place them accordingly into the different rows. If you are the card that gets past the number five, the fifth card in a row, up. Oh, You got to take that row of cards into your scoring pile. And taking cards is bad because taking points is bad. Mm -hmm. And points are represented on the cards by little cow heads or bull heads, uh, little icons on the top of the cards. And some have a lot of them and some have fewer, but you don't want them no matter what. And when somebody hits a certain amount of points, then the game's over and whoever has the highest score loses the game. (laughs) I love Six Nymphed as a game, period. I will play it anytime. It's one of my all-time favorite card games. But the reason why I wanted to make sure Six Nymphed was on this list is you can play at least two other great games with this set of cards. Ah. Hmm. You can also play The Game which you can get a beautiful edition from Pandasaurus that has Quan Chi Moria art. And I definitely recommend you do that because I love that edition. I play it all the time. But both games just use a deck of cards. Now, Six Nymph goes up to like 140 something. One uh, the game only needs cards up to 100. Yep. You can also play a great game called No Thanks if you just have some tokens or some chips mm. or cubes or 
pennies or something lying around as well. And no thanks, you just use like one through 35 of the deck or something like 36. that. I can't remember how many. 36, thank you. And uh, your pennies, and you can play a great game of no thanks. So if you know the rules for six nymphed, the game, and no thanks, just a deck of six nymphed will let you play all three. Wow. So it's like super duper bargain <laughs> to get three yeah. awesome games Absolutely. out of one $15 pack. Yeah. Wow, look at that. That's and awesome. I think I, I think Six Nymphed plays up to 10 people, if I'm not mistaken. What? Yeah. Really? No, you're, you're, now you're that. just goofing No, it's because it's 104 cards. And so, yeah, it's 10 cards for each player. Huh. huh. Plus the four that start out on the board. So 104. Right. Look at that. Oh, my gosh. It just things. makes it even better. <laughs> I think we found the perfect game. Absolutely. I, uh, yeah, I can't argue. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Eric and Mandy, for for serving up some wonderful slices of this game pie. I think this was a really fun one to do. Yeah. And it's a good exercise, too, to sort of look at, you know, try and look at the other end. And, and I actually started looking. I, I, I sorted by price on Game Nerds. <laughs> <laughs> and just started looking like what is what's the cheapest stuff they've got? And yeah, you run into a bunch of expansions and small little promo cards. But sure. you know, it was st- sort of neat to say, oh, that's that's only a six dollar game. Really, that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I purposely did Canadian prices because it really is. It really shows sometimes a disparity in prices between us and yeah. uh, the U.S. Mm-hmm. And I can't speak for other places, but I know it's something similar. So, you know, what's $15 for someone in the U.S. is maybe 20 to 22 for us. So I really thought it was important that I did it in Canadian dollars. So people who are Canadian or, you know, others listening can say, hey, no, these are some games that are still within that bracket for us. Yeah. So. I'm glad that you did. And I, I love that you offer that perspective, that it's very easy for somebody like me to kind of just get myopic and selfish and just focused on kind of my experience in the industry or in the hobby. Whereas I love that you bring that perspective as somebody not in the USA and, and kind of how challenging certain elements can be for you that we don't have to encounter. Hey, so thank you for that. We all do it. I think Canada's awesome. So, you know, I'm always going to push the Canadian <laughs> <Lovely>. agenda. <laughs> I knew it. (laughs) All righty, folks. We will call that an episode. Hey, you know, Eric's up next with Tom. And they won't be doing a QA and a next episode. But they will, I'm sure, very, very soon. (laughs) And Mandy and I are collecting questions for whenever we manage to to shove another question and answer on our episodes. So send those questions or comments in. Hey, if there are other games that you love at that $15 or lower price Mm -hmm. point that we forgot, mention them. And and we'll, we'll open up the next episode with some of those because I'm sure that we've forgotten some, just like Eric managed to land on ultra tiny epic galaxies. (laughs) Yeah. Like, a freaking hero <laughs> and um i want to hear more about it because i think this is a really fun topic so send in your thoughts on that send us your questions you can reach me at suzanne at dice tower.com you can reach me at mandy that's mandy with an i at dice tower.com and i'm eric that's eric with a c at dice tower.com as always it is a pleasure and privilege to be here podcasting and talking with you about games thank you so much for including us in your extended gaming family we really truly deeply appreciate you and that next episode hey oh 718 eric what's that gonna be it's gonna be the dice tower awards and i'll be recording it live at dice tower hq with with tom and special guests so i'm, I'm looking forward to it Ta-da! All right, folks, until next time, I'm Suzanne Sheldon. I'm Mandy Hutchinson. And I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support... The Jack Vassal Memorial Fund is an organization dedicated to helping gamers in need. Learn more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassal.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Suzanne, Mandy, and Eric with assistance from Roy Canaday and Rob Searing. Our theme is composed by Timothy Pinkham and arranged by Matt Bellier. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at boardgamegeek.com 
following the Dice Tower on Twitter or by emailing us at podcast at dicetower.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network at dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. All right, everyone, it's that time again for Two Truths and a Lie, and I'll go first with mine from last episode. So I've locked the keys inside of the car, I have locked myself out of the house, and I have been trapped inside of an elevator. If you said that I have locked myself out of the house was the lie, you would be correct. I have done the other two, but not out of the house. Oh my gosh, you've been trapped in an elevator? It was horrifying, and I, oh, oh my goodness, I, I would never wish that on anybody. So, horrible experience, and let's hope it never happens again. Oh my god, oh, terrible. <laughs> All right, from last episode, I was in a very different place, and I said, I've tipped cows, I've lassoed sheep, and I've ridden a camel. And the lie is that I've lassoed sheep. I tried when I was on a ranch as a teenager to learn how to use a lasso, and I could not. That thing is hard, but I've done the other two. Yeah, I'm still stuck on I've tipped cows. That That's a story for another podcast, I think. <laughs> All right, new up this uh, episode. Here we go. I copied Suzanne here, so sorry, everybody. (laughs) Since the pandemic, I mostly wear gym clothes. I haven't had a haircut, and I wear makeup daily. This is actually trickier than you think, so good luck with this one. (laughs) Look how stylish you are, yeah. And new for me this episode, since the pandemic started, I haven't eaten out at a restaurant. I have not had a haircut, and I have not gone out without a mask. Ooh, some good stuff here, everybody. Good luck. 